Good morning, church. I bring greetings to you from my home church in St. Charles. Uh, I was, I made a joke in the first hour that some people were far too happy to spare me, but apparently while I was preaching, one of my pastors called me and had a tech question, so I hope he figured it out. Uh, Go with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 44. (coughs) We'll be in chapters 44 and 45 this morning. Now last week, I hope many of you were here, we'll be referencing Isaiah 6 consistently, and, and from there you learned about Yahweh, the Holy One. Today we're going to learn about Yahweh, the Only One. And to help you understand, since we're jumping from chapter 6 to chapters 44 and 45, that's a big jump. I want to help give some context to get us caught up in our minds to where Isaiah wants us to be to hear his truth. This whole section, chapters 40 through 48, is encouraging Israel to turn from idols to the one true God, the incomparable God. And so this book is written, as you know, by the prophet Isaiah. You were introduced to him last week, and Isaiah spent the first 39 chapters speaking of a coming judgment, specifically the Babylonian exile and conquest. And for 39 chapters, Israel ignores him because they are blind and deaf and dull to the truth, as you learned about last week. And then chapter 40, he switches up his delivery style. He's again just trying to break through and get Israel to understand. And so he begins speaking of this coming judgment as something that has already happened. So from chapter 40 through 48, he talks about the Babylonian exile as though it has already happened, even though it would not happen for a a long time coming. We'll pick up, like I said, in chapter 44, so make sure you're there. We'll get there in just a moment. But again, I want to help us understand not just the historical context, but the cultural context, the situational context. Israel and Iowa both start with an I, but we probably think there's more differences than similarities, right? Right? Now, I'm from Missouri, so I'm not going to make any Iowa jokes, but there's still differences, right? There's still differences. Um, The big thing to understand, though, this is the big key to understand about the context, is that Isaiah has been promising coming judgment on Israel. He's been promising it over and over and over and over again, and they have just refused to understand it. And so I want to help you think through that. They, They should have turned to God. That's a whole message. But instead, they turned to idols. So how many of you, when you were younger, to get you in that mindset, your mom told you not to play ball in the house, like over and over again, right? How many of you then immediately played ball in the house, right? So you're playing ball in the house, you throw the ball, and you knock over your mom's favorite vase. It breaks. Your mom walks in the room and says the most dangerous words, you wait till your father gets home, right? In that moment, you know what Israel feels like. There's that promised coming judgment. You know what that feels like. Now, in that moment, you have two options. Israel had two options. The the child could run to the father as soon as he gets home and says, I have sinned. Fall down on his face in the carpet. I have sinned. I am not worthy. Please bestow your mercy on me. But that's not always what the child chooses to do, right? As I was thinking through this sermon, I was reminded of something my cousin did. Well, technically my wife's cousin, so it's less embarrassing for me. My wife's cousin knew he was going to get spanked because of something he'd done, and he always got spanked with a paddle. And so in his little seven-year-old mind, he's like, I know what I'll do. I'll steal the paddle. (laughs) Because then my parents have no power over me. Like, that's what his mind went to. So he sneaks in, he steals the paddle, he hides it, and his parents, you know, his dad comes home and guess how well that went for him. (laughs) Right? Not great. Or maybe, uh, I heard about another kid, he walked in confidently to get his spanking wearing seven different pairs of pants, because he was like, I will be safe from my judgment now. How many of you ever tried something like that? How well did it go for you, (laughs) right? This is what Israel is doing. They could have turned to God, they could have turned to the judge and pleaded for mercy, but instead, they went consistently, they went consistently to other things to save them from judgment. And it went just about as well as it did for my cousin. So we see, we must turn from idols to God. Now some of you may be thinking, why is this weird dude from Missouri talking about idols? Right, we're modern cultured Americans, we don't bow down to idols. But I'm sure many of you know, there are something called the idol of the heart, the idols of our hearts. The Bible, especially the New Testament, is full of this. Colossians 3 says, this is written in the New Testament to New Testament Christians, 
Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul says that covetousness, which is ultimately wanting something more than we want God, more than we want to please God, is idolatry. So I did that today, much less every day of my life. I've wanted something more than to please God. And I'm sure, not because I know you personally, but because I know the word, all of you have all wanted something more than God. So this lesson, this sermon on turning from idols to God is not out of step with our culture. It is something our culture greatly struggles with. It is something that we individually greatly struggle with. So pray with me and we'll go to our text and we'll ask God to humble us and show us our idols. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that though it's written to an ancient people about ancient context and ancient things, it is still just as relevant today as it was in Isaiah's day. That you know our hearts just like you knew theirs. That you know our situation just like you knew theirs. And you have written through the prophet Isaiah to our own hearts that we would be convicted of our sin. That we would see our need to change. And that we would repent of our idolatry. God, help us turn to you from our idols for salvation. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your son that enables us to have the unity together. The hope to study your word this morning. Bless us with your spirit even that we would understand and apply. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, I was uh, tasked with chapters 44 and 45 uh, as you go through Isaiah. That's a lot of material. It's a lot of context. We will not be able to hit every verse. But if you'll go with me to chapter 45, verses 22 and 23, from there we will draw our outline for today. I've got them up on the screen as well. The verses say, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear allegiance. I see in these two verses a good outline to understand both of these chapters. So there's a big command. The first two lines are a command. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. It's a command. That's what we have to do. That's the hope. My hope is that from this sermon and from the work of Christ in your heart, you would turn from idols to God and be saved. But then if you look at that little word there, for, it's in italics, whenever you see the word for in the Bible, you should ask, what is the for there for? And in this verse, it's to give us reasons. So he says, here's your command, and then he gives us three reasons that we must do this. So if you're an outline person, I'm going to spoil the outline, just so you know. But turn to me and be saved, for, number one, I am God and there is no other. That's the first one. So the first reason we turn to God is because of who God is. Because of who he is. Number two, because of what he has done. It says, by myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. What has God done? Well, he has spoken. He has already spoken. He's done something. So because of who he is and what he's done. And then finally... It says, to me, every knee shall, we've switched to future tense, to me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. And so from this text, I draw outline, we must turn to God for salvation because of who he is, because of what he has done and because of what he will do. Now, don't, don't fall asleep on me, just got to give you my outline, right? Let's walk through the passage and let's see it together. Go back to chapter 44. We'll look at verses 21 through 26. Like I said, we won't hit every verse. We're going to go topically. But we'll hit the whole main point that Isaiah wants us to grasp. Again, chapter 44, verses 21 and 26. Here, we will see that we must turn to God from our idols because of who God is. Read verses 21 through 26 with me along your Bibles. Remember these things, O Jacob, and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you, you are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud, and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Israel and will be glorified in Israel. For thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who made all things, who stretched out, or stretched alone, the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners, 
who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins. So you see, we must turn to turn from our idols to God for salvation because of who he is. Well, who, well, number one, he is the former. Not as in he no longer is, but he's the one who forms. He's the creator. The word form is all throughout these two chapters, constantly being used. God is the former. What has he formed? Well, first he's formed Israel. He's formed Israel. Verse 21 says, Jake, or Israel, you are my servant. I formed you. I formed you. Now, literally, God formed Jacob in the womb. Right? He chose Jacob, he grew Jacob, he helped Jacob to grow in the womb, he blessed him throughout his life. Figuratively, he formed Israel, for he led them out of Egypt, and he led them into the promised land. And he not only led them out, but he also gave them a national identity, a culture, laws. He gave them, ultimately he formed them into a nation, not just a random group of people in the desert, but a nation. He formed them. He formed Israel. And yet, Israel rejects him. This would be like, to compare it, would be a child packing up a tiny suitcase full of toys, walking out of their parents' house and saying, I know you made me, but you're not my parents. These people across the street, they're my parents now. It's ridiculous. It's the height of foolishness. A child who did that, we would call that child crazy. And yet this is what Israel is doing. And that's a major theme all throughout chapters 40 through 48, especially in these two chapters, is the foolishness of rejecting God. Now, I want to be clear, if you are in this room and you are rejecting God, I'm not trying to be rude by saying you're foolish, because ultimately the Bible said it, right? But I want to challenge you, there is hope even in our foolishness, and we'll get to that. So God formed Israel, but he also formed the whole earth. Verse 23, he talks about the heavens, he talks about the earth, he talks about the mountains, he talks about the trees. Why does God mention all these things? Well, because he created them for his own glory, for his own purpose. And his purpose was to glorify him, that they would sing his praise and worship him. And I think it's interesting, remember this whole context is about idols. Where do people normally put their idols? On top of a mountain and in the woods. What do they normally make idols out of? Rocks and trees, right? And so God is like, look, you're using all these things for totally the opposite purpose I created them for. It, again, to compare to it, would be like if you bought a self-driving car that wouldn't drive. It's a there's no purpose in that car. It's a terrible car. You made a bad decision, right? Because your, your car, your self-driving car, will not fulfill its purpose. Israel was created to worship God. The whole earth was created to worship God. And yet, Israel said, I reject my purpose. Again, foolishness. But God not only formed Israel, he not only formed everything, he also formed truth itself. You see, verse 25 says that God frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners. You see, Israel was turning to anyone who would say anything except what God said. It didn't matter what crazy nonsense the person was saying. As long as it didn't match what Isaiah said, they were all for it. Ever been there in your heart where you're like just looking for any answer but what's in the Bible? If you don't like what the Bible says? Again, if you've ever played a board game with a child, maybe I just know bad children. That's why all my examples of kids are bad. <laughs> I need to meet some nicer children. But if you've ever played a board game like Monopoly with a child, and you've, you know, there's rules to Monopoly, right? But when the child starts losing, what starts happening? They're like, oh, I just remembered a rule. I get to take 500 bucks from the, uh, from the bank, right? I'm not saying I ever did that. I'm just saying other kids did that, right? <laughs> but what happens? When you start rejecting the rules of the creator of the game, I know I'm stretching the analogy, but when you start rejecting the rules of the game, you just lose all sense of ability to understand anything that's going on. It's no longer Monopoly. It's just random throwing fake money around, right? It's not a game anymore. Israel was rejecting God. Even though he formed them, he formed everything, and he formed truth itself. You see, we must turn to God from idols because of who God is. He's the former. He's the creator. And Israel just rejected that truth. Israel just rejected that truth. But not only did they reject that, they also, they also rejected God as the not only is the one who made them, but the one, right, all throughout this passage, he says, I chose you, I loved you, he's with them. And as I thought about this, as I thought about them rejecting God, how God just doesn't compare to these little g gods, right? Because Baal and Asherah, the, the two main ones that Israel tended to worship, they didn't form Israel, they didn't form the world, they didn't form truth. 
Now, even, even historically, like the people who worship Baal didn't even say Baal was the one who made everything. They'd say he was the god of storms or fertility. So he's like the god of a few things, not even the god of, the, of all the things, right? And yet, Israel still rejected Yahweh and went after these second-rate little g-gods. And as I thought about how to make that understandable, because again, in, in America, we don't tend to reject the God of Israel, the God of, of Jacob, the God of Christ. We don't tend to reject that for other gods. We tend to just reject it for other things. Uh, I was reminded of, a, of the new Pepsi ad campaign. If you guys see the new Pepsi commercials? If you haven't, here's what happens. There's a guy in a diner, and he's sitting down, and the waitress comes up, and he says, hey, can I have a Coke? And the waitress does not say this. She does not say, I have great news for you. We don't have Coke, but we have something better. We have Pepsi. I'll go get you a Pepsi right now, and it'll be great. It's not what the waitress ever says, right? If you ask for a Coke and they don't have Coke, what do they say? Oh, is Pepsi okay? Right? And they're like ashamed and saddened. This might be a Coke town, so if I'm offending anyone, I'm not, like, I'm not trying to say anything bad. But if you say, I want a Coke, and they say, oh, is Pepsi okay? Right? They're not excited to tell you that news. And this is what Israel was doing. They were saying, look, I've got Yahweh, but I don't want Yahweh. You know what? Baal's okay. Baal's not as good. Baal's not the original. Baal's not the former. But I'll take Baal. I'll take Asherah. I don't want Yahweh. This is what Israel was doing. We should be able to see, even in a blind taste test, that the Lord is good. We should be able to taste and see that he is good. You see, God... God is their former. That's who he is. But he's not just their former. He's also the only God. So why doesn't he compare to the false gods? Well, ultimately, because the false gods don't even exist. They don't even exist. <clears throat> Read chapter 44, verses 6 through 8 with me, where the Bible says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, Beside me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare it and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. For, I have, for have I not told you from of old and declared it? Are you not my witnesses? Is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. There's a ton of stuff, even in those three verses, we could unpack. But for the sake of time, I want to look, look closely at verse Six, God says, I'm the first, I'm the last, beside me there is no God. This is one of the most exclusive statements God could possibly make, and here's why. He says, I'm the first. So if he's the first, that means no one made him, which means no one's more powerful than him. He's the first. He also says he's the last. So if he's the last, it means God didn't make any other gods who are less powerful than him. So there's no one greater, there's no one before, there's no one lesser, there's no one after. And he says, and there is no God beside me. There's no one equal with him. So if there's no one greater, equal, or lesser, there's no one before, during, or after, you're kind of out of options of where these other gods could come from, right? There are no other gods. When you start talking in, uh, about Christian cults, they're always talking about, oh, God, like God's just the God of this world. There's, there's other gods. Well, I feel like if there were other gods, God would at least know about them, right? But he says, is there a God beside me? I know not any. And so then we start questioning the character of God. You see, there is only one God. There is no one before, after, or current with him. He is the only God. And ultimately, that makes the worship of idols foolish. Look down at verses 12 through 17. Um, I'm going to say this real quick as an aside. I don't think sarcasm is always wrong. It's I mean, it depends on your heart, right? So sometimes sarcasm is biting and unloving. But it's not always wrong. And I, one of the reasons I say this is because this is one of the most sarcastic paragraphs in the entire Bible. So I'm going to put some inflection into it. And I think it's there. So read it with me. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with a strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. 
So God's describing the way he finds the material he's going to make his idol out of. <clears throat> then verse 15. Then the tree, it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. I love this. This is one of my favorite words in the whole Bible. Also, as though that's just the next normal step in your day, he kindles a fire and breaks bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it, right? Like on your to-do list for the idol makers, I'm going to cut down this tree, I'm going to make my bread, and then I'll make God, right? Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire, over half he eats meat, he roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, deliver me, for you are my God. You are my God. In this passage, God is exposing the foolishness of our idols. They cut down a tree, they cook over half of it the same tree they make into their God. They themselves get tired and worn out making these gods. So if they get tired making a god, how strong could that god really be? And on top of that, I love that he says, deliver me for you are my God. You are the God that I have made. You are the God that I have made. Now as a modern, cultured, forward-thinking American church, we may be thinking, well, how can someone be so foolish? How could anyone cut down a tree and knowingly divide it in half and worship half and burn half? How could they do that? Well, God answers that question. Look at verse 18. He says, they know not nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot understand. These verses remind me of Isaiah 6, where God warns Isaiah, hey, you're going to go to these people, and they're going to be deaf, they're going to be blind, and they're going to be dull of mind. Why do these foolish people worship idols? Because they are blinded and deaf, because they do not understand the truth. Ultimately, yes, they are so foolish. But I think that should greatly impact the way we see people who are not in Christ, right? When we see people who are destroying their lives with drugs and sex and alcohol, when they're destroying their lives with their career, when they're destroying their lives with the things of this world that do not last, and we say, how could they be so foolish? Don't they see that destroys them? And it's easy for us as Christians to be judgmental and say, look at these people, they're so foolish. Well, yeah, they are, but why? Because they're blinded, because they're deafened because they're dull and ultimately we as christians do the same thing don't we we find things that we find satisfaction in, even though it's temporary and we go after them rather than the god who satisfies forever we pray that we may not physically bow down and cross our hands we have lucky items and we pray to lady luck and we do all kinds of things we worship idols all the time but that leaves one question how did we get that way? How do unbelievers get that way? How did Israel get blinded, deafened, and dumb? Well, verse 18 says, he has shut their eyes. Who is the he? Well, the he refers to Yahweh himself. What does it mean that God makes them blind? God is not up in heaven just hatefully throwing down blindness on people. You see, he is, it's a form of his judgment. Romans 1 tells us that Idol worshippers claiming to be wise became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Why do we naturally in our hearts, why does man go after idols? Because we love them more than God and God says, all right, here you go. I give you up to the desires of your hearts. God is a gracious God and he is a good God and he will give us the desires of our hearts. So when we desire idols... He gives us idols. But that brings us to an even more important question. If Israel was blinded and deafened and dull of mind, if we are the same way today, what hope do we have? Right? We can't just realize it's foolish. The blind man can't just realize he's blind. What hope do we have? Well, our second two points. Ultimately, we must turn to God from idols for salvation because not only who he is, because of what he has done what he has done. Read verse uh, 1 and 5 of chapter 44. 1 through 5, chapter 44, we see what God has done. 
He says, but now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen, thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob. Another will write on his hand the Lord's and name himself by the name of Israel. You see, we must turn to God for salvation because of what he has done. So what has he done? Well, first of all, he's chosen a people. He's chosen a people. God chose Israel, and Isaiah refers to Israel by three names in this passage. Israel, Jacob, and Jeshurun. Now, Jacob, if there's anybody in here named Jacob, I'm not trying to offend you, but Jacob literally means deceiver, right? So God looked down through history. He looked into the womb. He saw Jacob and Esau, and he goes, all right, one of these guys is named, you know, Harry, pretty weird name, but whatever, and the other one is named deceiver, and he picks deceiver. If, if your daughter, like, was getting ready to, to date a guy, and she brings a guy home, and she goes, hey, I, I want to introduce you to this guy. I really think I might want to date him. His name is deceiver. You'd be like, you have chosen poorly, daughter, right? You're not going to support that choice. But God looked forward and said, I'm going to choose this man named Deceiver. Interesting choice on God's part. And then it says, Isaiah refers to him as Israel. And we've been talking about how much Israel messed up all day, right? Israel certainly was not the greatest of nations. It was a nation of nothing. It was, when God chose him, it was ultimately some guy in another country. It wasn't even a nation. And God chose him. But then the third name is Jeshurun. And I love this. The name literally means righteous ones. And I'm pretty sure, can't prove this conclusively, but it's, it only shows up a few times in the scriptures. And I believe every time it is used sarcastically. When Isaiah uses this word, he is referencing Deuteronomy 32, 15 through 18, which says this. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. He grew fat, stout, and sleek. Then he forsook the God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. It doesn't make any sense for God to say, now you righteous ones, you've done these things, right? He's being sarcastic. He's like, you're not righteous. Isaiah calls them Jeshurun to remind them of this prophecy. This was something Moses said. This was something Moses said hundreds of years before Isaiah's time. God was not surprised by Israel's idolatry. He was not surprised. Here's why that's hopeful. God was not in heaven looking at Israel's idolatry and being all concerned and saying, man, this nation sure is a lemon. Like, I should have done a Carfax or something. What is wrong with these people? Right? God was not surprised. He knew what kind of people he was purchasing. He knew what kind of people he was redeeming. And not only did he choose them, but he also chose a redeemer. Go to chapter 44, verse 27. We'll read through the next chapter, through verse 7. Here Isaiah says, and this is God speaking, God says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, to loose the belt of kings, to open doors before him, the gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. That people may know from the rising of the sun, and from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. <clears throat> you see, we must turn to God for miles because of what he has done. Not only did he choose a people, he's also chosen a redeemer. 
this man Cyrus that's referenced, he was a king of Babylon, he would not be born for another 100 years after this prophecy was made. Here's why that encourages me so much. God did not have it on his to-do list to figure out how to rescue Israel from Babylon. It's not like he was up there working out the plan of history. He's like, okay, we'll throw him into captivity, and then yada, yada, something will happen, we'll figure it out. Right? God wasn't flying by the seat of his pants up there. When Israel went into captivity, he's like, oh, what are we going to do? God had a plan so specific that over 100 years before the man was born, he knew who he would use to redeem them. God knew they would sin, and he knew how he would rescue them specifically. And look at verse 1 of chapter 45. God calls Cyrus his anointed one. This is the same word in Hebrew that we get the word Messiah from. Now, Isaiah is not saying that Cyrus was like Jesus in disguise. That's not the point. Because Jesus is the ultimate Messiah, the ultimate anointed one. But Cyrus, the only Gentile in the Bible to receive this title, would rescue Israel. You see, all throughout Scripture, different people are given the title anointed one, and they were used to redeem Israel. And Cyrus, this Gentile man who no one would expect, is the one that God would use to save them. Well, here's why this is so encouraging. Uh, I've been working on some things in my house, and I tried to fix some stuff, and I made it worse, so then I had to hire a contractor. And as I looked for a contractor you've done this, the first thing I did is I went online, I found some companies, and then I read reviews of those companies. And I checked the Better Business Bureau, and I checked a bunch of things, and I called people, and I was like, hey, this guy gave me this estimate, does that sound reasonable, right? So I'm checking around, doing a lot of work before I just hire a guy to do something in my house for a day. God didn't, like God knew all the bad stuff about Israel and chose them anyway, right? God didn't go to the Better Nation Bureau and figure out if Israel was worth picking, He knew they weren't, and he picked them anyway. And so we find great hope in that because God chooses people not based on their goodness, but based on whom he has chosen to place his blessing on. So perhaps you're struggling with a specific idol today. Maybe you're struggling with the idol of self-worth that is so pervasive in our culture. You maybe said things like, if I ever cross the doorpost of a church, lightning will strike me. I don't deserve to be here. Maybe right now you you feel like you don't deserve to be here. Well, friend, let me encourage you. None of us deserve to be here. That's like the whole point, right? None of us deserve to be here. But Christ does. And we are in him. We are given his righteousness. So if you have an idol of self-worth that's preventing you from serving, preventing you from joining, preventing you from giving or working in this church, let me challenge you. Lay down that idol. Lay it down and trust in the worth of Christ. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Now, some of you, You don't struggle that way. You're just rejoicing. You're thankful God, the only God, has chosen you and saved you. You're glad for that. But some of you are still doubting. Some people here today are thinking, sure, God is the only God, and sure, he may have chosen me, but what if I mess it up? What if, I mean, maybe God knew how bad I was, but I've just been so bad. How could God ever love me? Well, you see, not only must we turn to God for miles because of who God is and what he has done, we also must turn to God for miles because of God, what God will do. Go to chapter 45. We'll read verses 14 through 23. And there the Bible says, Thus says the Lord, The wealth of Egypt, and the merchandise of Cush, and the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other, no God beside him. Truly, you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. All of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go in confusion together. But Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens. He is God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Assemble yourselves and come together. Draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? 
and there is no other God beside me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Turn to me and be saved for all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. You see, in this passage, there is no doubt in God's mind. There is no worry that it may not work out. There is no if in this passage. There is only confirmed fact. God will save his people. He will save his people. And you may ask, but what about? And before you even get to ask, God is just knocking down every excuse you can think of. We look through these verses. Verse 14, Egypt and Cush, they're powerful nations, but they can't stop God's plan. We think about verse 16, the false gods, they're all put to shame. They can't stop God's plan. Verse 17, it talks about salvation lasting to all eternity. Time cannot stop God's plan. It talks about nothing in heaven and on earth. Why? Well, God made those things so they can't stop God's plan. Verse 19, no darkness can stop God's plan. His word is the light in that darkness. Verse 20, no ignorance. These people with their idols, they don't know God, but he invites them in anyway. Their ignorance cannot stop God's plan. And we all agree with that. We're all like, yeah, amen. But then what about our sin? What about the things I do that no one knows? What about my addictions and my struggles? What about that? Can that stop God's plan? Well, read verses 24 and 25 with me. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. In the Lord all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. You see, it says we shall be justified. It says we shall glory. So no, our sin cannot stop God's plan, not even our own sin. But how? How can this be? How can we as idol worshipers, as foolish, blind, deaf, dull of mind people, how could God ever save us? Well, look closely at those two verses. You see in verse 24, it says, only in him is there any righteousness. Only in Yahweh is there any righteousness. But then in verse 25, it says, and the Lord, the offspring of Israel shall be justified. And that word justified and that word righteous are the same word in Hebrew, the same root word. So God, in two conditions, it says, only I am righteous and my people will be righteous. Only in me is there righteousness and my people will be righteous. How can that be? How can Israel ever hope to be righteous when they are blind, deaf, dull, and they cannot understand the hope that they have? Well, ultimately, because God was going to send a greater anointed one, a greater Messiah, who would deny every idol, who would worship God thoroughly, who would trust him for who he is, what he's done, who would trust in what he would do, and Christ came and was righteousness for us. You see, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, it says, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, we are in, we are part of, we are united with, we are one with Christ Jesus. And he came to this earth and he lived perfectly for us. He did not ever bow down to a physical idol, to an idol in his heart. He only loved God. He never coveted. He only loved God. And because of that, he is our righteousness. For Christians, we don't need to earn our way into heaven. That's not our hope. Our hope is not in finally tearing down our, our high places and getting rid of our idols. Our hope is in God. If you are not in Christ today, you have the same hope. Let me challenge you. Just like Israel had coming judgment that was promised, so also do you. God has said that Christ will come back with a sword and will judge every heart. And it will cut to the depths. We will not be able to hide anything. We will stand in judgment. And our hope in that moment will not be, God, I destroyed most of my idols. Or in my effort, I even destroyed all of them by myself. Our hope, our only hope, is that we will be in Christ by God's grace, and he will be our righteousness for us. Like we sang all morning, like we read all morning, like we've heard all morning, our hope is in God and God alone. So for those of you who are in Christ, you may think, okay, great, I'm done. I've been saved. Well, who was Colossians written to? It was written to Christians. So we have to put off our idolatry today. We have to put down the idols in our hearts. So let me give you two examples of modern day idols. Number one, maybe you're living for the idol of your reputation. You've spent years building it. You put effort in every day to make sure it looks good and fresh. The very idea of confessing real problems to people in the church, oh, 
That would ruin the nice varnish you've put on it. What would people do? You, you think things like this. What would people do if they knew about your struggles, about your pornography, about your drugs and your alcohol? What would they do if they knew your marriage was falling apart? What would they do if they knew I don't know what to do with my kids and I'm at my wit's end? Well, friend, they would know that you're a sinner just like all of us. This idol of our reputation is so dangerous. It's so dangerous. And I have to confess, when I wrote these words that I've just spoken to you, I was not thinking of myself. And then yesterday, I had a contractor, I thought, turns out it wasn't my contractor, it might have been somebody else, really mess up something in my house, and I just got angry, so angry. And I thought, I'm just angry at this person because they really messed up. But it wasn't that person's fault. I was angry because I wanted the good reputation of I have done things well and I've handled my household well. I wanted people to think well of me for how I handled my own business. And I was broken in that moment because I called and I left a very angry voicemail on that contractor's voicemail. And I love my wife. I'm not trying to out her, but it might have been my wife. We're not sure. But it definitely wasn't the contractor. So I left him this really angry voicemail. I'm like, I can't believe you tore up my yard. How could you do this? And then I had to call in shame. I had to call him again and say, I was loving myself. I was, he wasn't a believer. He knows I work at a church. And I had to call and say, I loved myself in that moment. And I loved my reputation in that moment more than I loved you. And more than I loved God and the opportunity to share the gospel with you. And I had to ask for his forgiveness. And I had to repent of my sin to this random guy who was at my house to fix a crack in my wall. I loved my idol of my reputation so much. Let me warn you, it's dangerous. It hides. But go after it, friends. Go after it. Let me give you another quick example. Maybe you're living for the idol of ease. Your focus in life is on making things easy. So you don't give sacrificially because then that, that might make your budget a little bit tighter. You don't sign up to serve anywhere because then you couldn't skip out on church if you wanted to. You don't join in membership because then you're held to account, right? There's a bunch of different ways we can live for ease rather than living for Christ. Let me tear down that idol. Let me give you a third one. Maybe you're living for the idol of now, whatever you're hoping I didn't say right there, <laughs> right? Whatever you're like, oh, I hope he doesn't say, that's probably your idol. So I can't go through every single idol, because one will overstay my welcome, and two, we don't have time, right? But whatever that thing is that you hope I didn't say, just pretend I've said it. And go home this week and spend time in God's word. Read through these two chapters meditate on his word and meditate on the hope we have in Christ. Don't boast in your righteousness. Don't boast like I did as I prepared a lesson about idols to preach to other people and their idols. Boast in the Lord and his salvation of your soul. Friends, let me pray with you as we ask God to humble us and to truly apply this truth to our hearts. Father, I thank you that you are a good and gracious God that you loved us enough to form us to be our creator. That you loved us enough to choose us, knowing the kind of people that we are, knowing the pride that we hide behind, knowing the idols that we worship. God, I thank you that you have chosen us, and not just chosen us, but chosen a redeemer from the foundation of the world, your son, was ready to die for us. And God, we thank you that you will save us. There is no if, there is no concern, there is no chance you will fail. We know that you will save us. That all the children of Israel, all of your children, will stand justified and glorified and righteous. God, in that new heaven and that new earth, we look forward to so much. We will never struggle with idols, either physical or of the heart. We will only look forward in worship to the praise of your name and we will live perfectly for you. But until that time, humble us. Help us cry out to the God who saves. Help us depend on the Messiah, the anointed one, to redeem us from our foolishness. And God, give us wisdom in God as we depend on our Savior. God, I thank you for how you've used this text in my own heart. I pray you would use it powerfully in the hearts of these people, that we would be united in our worship of Yahweh, the one true God. And it is in his name that I pray. Amen.